now I would like to invite James Tabor. He, will, he is a um, um, professor of Christian origins at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And his paper is entitled, When Jerusalem Means Jerusalem, Christian Prophecy Belief on the Ground in the Holy Land. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here when I uh, saw on one of our new religious movements lists that you were meeting in Jerusalem. I was quite pleased since I am already here. I don't live here, but every year I'm here for two months doing uh, Mount Zion excavation outside of Zion Gate. I hope you'll all see it. It's a fabulous excavation. Uh, we're the only American university digging in Jerusalem, and I have 119 people here this year with Shimon Gibson, and we're uncovering these second temple areas. So uh, I was already here. Uh, what better thing than to just uh, walk down the road and attend such a, a great gathering? Um, yesterday at this time, speaking of the heat, I had 74 people on Masada, and it was 110 Fahrenheit. So we made it all right with preparation, but uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I see it's not on your list for uh, tours. But it, when you're on Mount Zion, ask your leader or guide if you can, it's right by the uh, Church of the Dormition and on down, if you can visit our site. Just look through the fence. You probably see us working. Well, maybe not if it's in the afternoon. So um, this is a published uh, you know, thir an unpublished 30-page paper, obviously I'll summarize it, but um, I want to talk, uh, I'm going to use as examples uh, Charles Taz Russell, uh, the Spaffords, who founded the American Colony Hotel, Andrew Duggar, Seventh-day uh, Church of God minister who moved here, Herbert Armstrong, who was one of his students, some of you know him as the founder of the Worldwide Church of God. And finally, David Koresh, who is also here and whom I've worked on the most. So before I get to those examples, let me lay a bit of groundwork. The name Jerusalem is used 764 times in the standard English Christian Bible, say the RSV. 626 are in the Hebrew Bible, sometimes called the Old Testament, and 138 in the New Testament. The name Zion is used 161 times. 154 in the Hebrew Bible, only seven times in the New Testament. I expect you to remember those numbers. So, okay. Many of these references are just geographical references to the city, right? Like, and David went up to Jerusalem. But quite a few of them are what we'd call prophetic references. That is, project, projecting a vision of Jerusalem in the future. It's usually an ideal or even perfected Jerusalem. It can either be in real historical time. Those are the ones that I'm more interested in. That's what I mean by on the ground. You actually come here. You don't just wait for Jesus to come and somehow take you either over here or to heaven. Um, or some sort of eschatological future. So we're going to deal with more of the on-the-ground kind of thing. Um, this should be s set alongside other visions of a future Jerusalem where there's a transposition to another place on the planet. Um, Eileen and George both alluded to that. You think of the Mormons in Utah or even in Missouri, talking about the New Zion, or my own ancestors, the Taborites, followers of John Huss. They form a town called Tabor. That's why I'm usually thought of as Jewish when I come here. My name, Ani Yaakov Tavor. <laughs> uh, so uh, why would they call it Tabor? Because they're on a mountain south of Prague, and they, they named the mountain Mount Tabor because Jesus, they wrongly think, as far as location, was transfigured on Mount Tabor. Probably that's not uh, really, that's a later crusader view that it was there. 
And so they said, well, he's going to come back again to the new Mount Tabor, but it'll be in the Czech Republic or Bohemia, not in that old Jerusalem uh, sort of thing. Lots of Bible references. Certainly the most dominant, I think, would be this one. Let me just read it to you, see if it's familiar. It was so important to David Koresh. It was important to Russell. It was important to the Spaffords and uh, to Herbert Armstrong, all of these groups. This is probably their banner verse. It's Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. By the way, it's inscribed on the wall of the UN uh, as you enter into the United Nations. So clearly it has a, a wide appeal. It'll come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house, let's use Jehovah instead of the Lord, that the mountain of the house of Hashem or Jehovah shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. So you can just walk outside and take a quick cab ride to the old city and you can see this mountain of the house of the Lord. So it's gonna be raised up either literally or figuratively but here's what then happens. And many people shall come. These are not Jews. These are other nations, the Goyim, the nations of the world. And they will say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, using that as also the word for Jerusalem, shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will decide for many peoples. This is the part that's on the UN wall. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So all of us can be inspired by that. In 1956, the Soviet Union had a statue cast of a robust looking kind of Soviet male beating a sword into a plowshare, quoting Isaiah, and they donated it to the UN. If you go behind, it's on the East River, and you can actually see. Uh, I thought, isn't that interesting that the Soviet Union, at that time supposedly atheistic, would say, we need an image for peace. Uh, how about Isaiah, chapter 2? So that's the base. There are many other passages. Here's, here's a short one. At that time, notice the time. Last days, at that time. At that time, Jerusalem will be, called, will be called the throne of uh, Jehovah, and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of Jehovah in Jerusalem. Now that sounds like you would buy a ticket, right? And maybe come over or take a boat or somehow get here. Notice it's not that you sit in your own place where you live and imagine the future, right? People are actually coming here. At least that's how those are read. And one more, and there are hundreds of these. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. This is God speaking. For lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of you, and many nations shall come and join themselves to Jehovah in that day. Notice, in that day. So it's supposed to happen in the future. And I will dwell in the midst of you, and you will know that uh, Jehovah has uh, sent me. It's actually a prophet speaking in Jehovah's name. So those are the literal passages that some Christians who read the Bible in a fairly literal way have said uh, that'll be something that will be observed by the whole world. I tell my students, if you can film it on CNN and report, you know, we're standing at the Mount of Olives, and yes, it has now split open, and you know, in other words, these things are taken very literally. Uh, it could involve Jesus as the Messiah, if you're Christian, but it also, you notice Isaiah 2 is not a Messianic passage. It's, it doesn't mention a Messiah, it, it's uh, God will uh, cause this to happen. So what happens in the mainstream church is Christians spiritualize that. Theologically, it's called supersessionism. You simply tick off all the main elements of the Hebrew Bible, starting with Israel. It's not physical Israel, but spiritual Israel. Jerusalem, it's not the literal dusty, dirty city, right, of the 19th century, but it's actually heavenly Jerusalem and so forth. So that all the main elements, the Torah, it's not a Torah scroll that you would read in a synagogue, it's the Torah written in the heart. It's not a temple that you would go to and worship because you are the temple of God. So this sort of, you could call it spiritualization, 
replacement theology, supersessionism, is clearly what the church fathers laid down, building on the Apostle Paul, where he likens, I'm sure not to his Jewish opponent's uh, favor, he likens Jerusalem on earth to the slave woman Hagar. Abraham has two sons, right? Normally, Jews would say, we're from Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Oh, no, you're from Ishmael. Not literally, right? That would be the Arab peoples, not literally. But spiritually, you're from Ishmael, meaning when you're born, you're born into the slavery of sin. But Jerusalem above, which has nothing to do with where we're sitting right now, is the mother of us all, you see? So we're the true children of Isaac, the Christians. So you get that reversal, that redefinition. That doesn't really leave much place then for reading your Old Testament, your prophecies, and taking it literally. Now, too much to cover just now today because I want to get to my examples, but this began to reverse in the 19th century. Um, John Nelson Darby, 1830s, former clergyman of the Anglican Church, he developed an idea called dispensationalism. His ideas get into the Schofield Bible, which is, uh, uh, let's, I, I wrote down the first time it was published, I think it was 1906 or something, let me look. Uh, 1917, millions of copies published. So it's Darby's ideas, he formed the Plymouth Brethren that begins the reversal. That reversal is very small at first, and now it's just astounding. Uh, among evangelical fundamentalist Christians in the United States, it is the dominant view by far, I would say 90%. And therefore, there's a support of the state of Israel with it. So what is it? What is that view? It's the view that Christians have not replaced the Jews with respect to all blessings. Okay, the Jews, the Christians partake of the spiritual blessings, but the physical ones still belong to the Jews. This is generous. The Jews are therefore still the physical heirs of the promised land and should play a part in gathering and preparing it for the Messiah. So you get a kind of Christian Zionism, right? Now that's literal. You come here, you actually build. Now, everybody knows Herzl, and most people think, oh, that's secular, Herzl's secular, it's nothing to do with any of this. But Herzl was connected to Christian Zionists. There's a Christian named uh, Heckler that some of you know about who introduced him to Kaiser Wilhelm II and really gave him the audience uh, in the European Parliament. He met Lord Rothschild and he met Chamberlain in 1902. And in his uh, diary, he does say this, just so you know he's not the proverbial secular Jew, holy. He said, when I was 12 years old, I had a dream that the King Messiah came, a glorious and majestic old man. He took me in his arms and swept me off with the wings of the wind. In one of the iridescent clouds, we encountered Moses and other figures. And the Messiah said to Moses, it is for this child, meaning him, that I have prayed, go declare to the Jews that I will come soon and perform great wonders and great deeds for my people and the whole world. That's a side of Herzl people don't know much about. And uh, he talks about it uh, somewhat even in Der Judenstadt, if you look at the introduction. Uh, but others are involved. Uh, David Lord George, Prime Minister of Britain during the war. The war here means 1916. He was of Welsh Baptist background, and he's extremely influenced by Darby's ideas that Israel means Israel, the Jews, and Jerusalem means Jerusalem, and it should actually be rebuilt literally in our time. It's very important. I just mentioned the Prime Minister. Lord Balfour, the Balfour Declaration, is influenced is a Christian Zionist, influenced by Christian Zionists. This has all been written about, and some of you know this. So the famous phrase, Her Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine is a statement of faith based upon interpretation of the prophets. Very important to understand that. Now, let me 
go to my examples. Charles Taz Russell, people think uh, he's the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. As George knows, that's certainly not the case. He would hate that idea. He's the founder of what he called Bible students. You don't have any name, you're just a Bible student. And he published these six volumes. And one of his most distinctive teachings is that Jews should return to the land of Palestine and rebuild it to prepare for the coming of Messiah. You could call him a Christian Zionist. In 1910, he conducted this famous meeting. You might have seen pictures of it in the New York Hippodrome. There were thousands of people gathered, including Jews, thousands of Jews, like Herzl did in Europe. And he, he says, we encourage you to go back and build the land. And he, he speculated that before 1914, is that a date we know? Uh, the Jews would be back in the land and there would again be a state of Israel. Not, he didn't necessarily call it Israel. Now the Spaffords I have particular interest in and I encourage you to visit the American Colony Hotel. It's the most lovely place I think you can go in Jerusalem. In the evening, the garden is open. Go about six or seven o'clock when it starts getting cool. You'll be blown away by its loveliness. What does that have to do with Christian Zionism? Oh, it's a sad story. I don't even know if I can tell it without uh, uh, being moved. But, I mean, without, you know, losing it. Um, Horatio and Anna Spafford lived in Chicago. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 destroyed, if you know Chicago, down to Michigan Avenue where the water tower is. And they devoted themselves as Christians to helping the fire victims and so forth. And after working for a couple of years, they were so tired, they were, he had a wealthy business, he, uh, Staff, Spafford's uh, uh, business survived. They said, let's take a trip to Europe. Let's go on holiday. So they took the four daughters and Anna, the wife. They went early because Horatio had some business to take care of before he could join them. They went on, they were headed for Switzerland to a lovely hotel. And tragically, there was a collision and all four Daughters uh, drowned. And Anna cabled, I bought this to read you because you can go to the colony and go inside the colony and look on the wall. You can read this telegram. She wrote to him. He didn't know. This is telegram back then. No iPhones, right? No text messages. Saved alone, what shall I do? And then she explains, the girls are dead. He's absolutely devastated. He's sitting in the hotel in Chicago. I've got the document here. Maybe you know the Brevert Hotel, Clark and LaSalle. And he writes this unbelievable, unbelievable song. I won't sing it for you. I could, but I won't. Uh, that any of us who grew up in evangelical Christianity know well. When peace like a river attends my soul and sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever the my lot you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So that's up on the display there. So go to the American colony. So why am I mentioning them? Well, I want you to go. But Anna heard a voice that said, even though the children are gone, there's a meaning and a purpose, and your work is not over. And then Horatio came up with the idea that Jesus would return by the end of 1881 and they need to get over there and do what they can to prepare the way. So they actually booked a ship, and 16 of them moved to Jerusalem. They lived by Damascus Gate for a few years. Later they lived uh, at the American colony because they took over the house of uh, Hussein Alfandi that had died with his four wives, you can read the whole story. And uh, guess what? Jesus didn't come, but they formed a uh, communal uh, kind of arrangement. It was a celibate community finally, sort of partially. Uh, it's a very strange thing, you have to read about it. I need to give a paper on sexuality and millennialism, but it's the idea of Paul that uh, Koresh is into it too. The time has come that those who have wives should be at those who have none because the appointed time of the, of the end is near. And so Horatio said to Anna, 
we won't sleep together anymore or have sex because we're so close to the end. But we also have to learn to resist temptation. And so the men of the community should regularly sleep with young girls that are very beautiful, not sexually, but just so they know how to resist. And this rumor got through Jerusalem. This is the 1890s. That what is going on behind the walls of the American Colony Hotel? It was probably perfectly innocent. Uh, before they took the vow of celibacy, celibacy, there were two other children born. And, uh, and one of them, Bertha, survived. I met her a few years ago. Used to always stay at the colony. So there's an example of an individual family and community that said, we need to go there. We need to be there, opposite of the Jehovah's Witnesses that would say, well, we, we can be anywhere, right, when it, when it happens. Another person I cover in the paper is Andrew Duggar. Maybe you've never heard of him. I know his family. I've interviewed them, talked to them. I became interested because he was the tutor of Herbert Armstrong, who established probably the largest millenarian movement uh, since William Miller, uh, the uh, Worldwide Church of God, Plain Truth Magazine, and so forth. But in Salem, West Virginia, November 4th, 1933, Duggar convinced the Church of God Seventh Day that God, is, that Jesus is coming soon, and we need to trust Jesus totally and move to Jerusalem, and to choose our 12 leaders will cast lots. That's really dangerous in a group of a few hundred. Let's decide by lots. And they chose 12 and 7 and 70. The 70 elders, New Sanhedrin, right? Seven in the book of Acts that run the administration and the business, and then the 12 apostles. And so uh, Herbert Armstrong was number 40. He made it in as one of the elders, 1933. But finally, in 1931, Duggar moved to Jerusalem. He bought a house just south of our excavation. I can see his house from our excavation. His granddaughter lives there now. I visited her and talked to her about it. And long ago, you know, the the stove has grown cold, you know, in terms of the front burner that Jesus is coming tomorrow and so forth. And yet they're still, still here and still very much a part of, uh, we should be in Jerusalem. They published this little magazine called the Mount Zion Reporter because they're just off of Mount Zion over the Hinnom Valley, which means hell. And uh, so they're right on the edge of hell and Mount Zion. And they were maybe the first, I think, of the Seventh-day Church of God Herbert Armstrong movement that I put those together that actually said, you got to come here. And Mr. Armstrong didn't say that, but here's what happened. After the Six-Day War, when Israel was back in Jerusalem, Herbert Armstrong connected with Teddy Kollek, the mayor of Jerusalem, after the Six-Day War, and Benjamin Mazara, the main archaeologist that was going to excavate south of the Temple Mount. And Mr. Armstrong was traveling over here. He was on his way when the war broke out. He flew back to England. Then he came back to meet uh, the officials here. And they said, why don't you, as a university, Ambassador College, sponsor the excavation? Money, right? And they said, we'll put $5 million in right now. And they did. And so they sent over 50 students. Any of you remember them? This was in 1968. These clean-cut kids, they look kind of like they might be Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, they're just really... Uh, they came to help excavate $6 million. So uh, they excavated, and uh, the students would come over and do study abroad and so forth. Now, at that point... Why is Mr. Armstrong, who believes in Jerusalem above, and you don't need to be in Jerusalem for all this to happen? That was Duggar. He broke with Duggar. Because now he's thinking, well, we're actually digging the real city. And he started saying, we're preparing the way for the coming of Christ. Because Christ is going to come and sit literally on the throne in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem. So there's too much rubbish around. That's what he said. I have a recording of him. He said, it's just full of rubbish, just garbage. We can't have Christ appear, and it's going to be such a mess. And uh, we got 2,000 years of debris even over the steps leading up to the temple. Let's clear that off. It was an odd kind of turn of events. And finally, I'm running out of time, so David Koresh. The David Koresh story, all of you who know my story know that's my hook into new religious movements. I study apocalyptic movements of 
early Christianity and ancient Judaism, but the transference is amazing. You can jump 2,000 years just like that because some of the same chronologies, the same hopes, the seven weeks prophecy, the Dead Sea Scroll people were already figuring that out. They just had it 2,000 years earlier, and it was also wrong. So um, anyway, so what did Chorus do? Uh, the Waco David Chorus, you know, the fire. He only had one disciple from Israel, Pablo Cohen, uh, who moved to Texas and died in the fire. I've talked to his mother after the tragedy. But many don't know David came here in 1985. He lived on Kabad Street in David Cherokee's apartment. I love doing this field work, knock on Cherokee's door. Can I see the apartment? He's, is it vacant? He said, I saw a rent sign. I want to go in David Corsh's apartment. Tell me all about it. So he told me that the day David moved out, he stayed a year. He said he's walking down the stairs with his guitar on his shoulder and he's, his pregnant wife, Rachel, who's going to bear Cyrus, is walking down and they're packing their things and headed back to America. David came here because he wanted to meet the rabbis, like Jesus did, at Eish HaTorah. Some of you are going to grin at that. So picture David Korsh knocking on the door of Eish HaTorah near the wall and saying, I've come to uh, teach you the Bible. And uh, like the rabbis of old, they weren't overly impressed with this young man. Uh, and remember, he was 33 years old when he died, and his father was a carpenter, and you've got all these parallels that they were excited about. But let me tell you what he did uh, also that I think is more important. And I'll, I'll close with this one. And my paper goes into all these, and I hope you'll read it when it's published. It's really fascinating kinds of stuff, these stories. He read in Revelation 14 that the lamb, whom he thought he was, will stand on Mount Zion with 144,000. So when he first got here, it's the first thing he did. He took a cab from Ben Gurion and he said, I want to go to Mount Zion. They brought him to Christian Mount Zion. You know, there are three Mount Zions. There's a city of David, there's a Temple Mount, and now Christian Mount Zion. He didn't know the difference. He goes up there, and you're going to go there, some of you, some of you have been. Dormition Abbey, Room of the Last Supper, David's Tomb. I don't think we can get 144,000. So it, maybe it's not literal. But see, he was already beginning to say Ellen G. White and the Adventists are wrong. They make everything spiritual. The millennium's in heaven. It's new Jerusalem, not literal. And he's taking it all literally. Like, we're going to be here with our 144,000 followers. So then someone, he, he said, is there any other space here? And this man said, come with me through the garden of the Domitian Abbey. I hope you'll go there. And suddenly you walk out and there is this largest space in all of Jerusalem, completely unbuilt on, open field, has two soccer fields, a tennis court. These are run down. I'm not saying don't go play there. But they're just, they're for the Greek Orthodox uh, seminarians. The Greeks just happened to own this huge plot of land. I'm hoping someday we can excavate there because it would be the very summit of Mount Zion. And I think we might. But David looks at that and he was absolutely confirmed. That's like your confirmation of Nor when he goes, oh, well, you know, this proves that we're right about this. He says, we can easily fit 144,000 in this space. And so I am right. Literally, I'm coming back right here where I'm standing, and my fathers will be here. We're going to fight with Israel in the last battle. So the reason Waco happened, as Eileen knows, and many of you, I say this in my books and articles, the government delivered David an apocalypse two years too early. In 1993, he did not think it was the end. He didn't have 144,000 followers. He had 110, I think. But once he got well-known, maybe conceivably he began to think, this could be working out. He expected it in 95. It had to do with the 70 weeks prophecy, the 1335 days, the 1290 days, the 1260 days of Daniel. If that sounds like gibberish, then you, you're not into these groups, but they all play with these dates. And so uh, he thought he would come and literally... Uh, be acknowledged by Jesus Christ who would return and stand on the Mount of Olives and say, David, my faithful son, come up here and there'd be the chosen ones and so forth. So that's what my paper is about. It's about this tremendous turn of taking the Bible literally. It has two parts to it. One is you're going to do it, a kind of messianic consciousness, 
like Koresh or somebody like that. You know, you're the guy or the girl. You're going to do it. And others are just let the Jews do it. Uh, and that's the more popular. It's kind of sinister, as you who are Jewish know very well. The Christian Zionists love you to death, <laughs> meaning uh, please come, build, grow, be great, so that Jesus can come and then you can convert or whatever. So thank you very much. One question? <laughs> I think you have a 15 minute break, so. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe stand up and speak, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Right. something that was very anti-Semitic. I mean, exactly. and Darby is very anti-Semitic. I think so, in, in so, uh, so, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of biblical prophecy and the, and, and the basic kind of biblical timetable, the, the, only, the, the main reason to support the reestablishment of the state of Israel and even the rebuilding of the temple, right, is so, in fact, yes, Jesus can come. And the Antichrist and then, can come. And yeah. then mm -hmm. doesn't, right. uh, doesn't all of uh, Judaism bow down right. to the Messiah, right? So that's, you know, the whole story is, now maybe that's in your paper, but anyway, that, I had, that, that Some was of that question. is, but I will say, you know, Darbyism, that's 1830, and it gets spread in many ways after Schofield, but let's take, uh, I would say, uh, Hagee in San Antonio, Texas, Christians United for Israel. Uh, he certainly would denounce the protocols strongly and would stand against all of that. He's closely associated with an Orthodox rabbi in San Antonio and so forth. And I think uh, Falwell and Robert, Pat Robertson and others wouldn't have picked that up, but you're right, it's got that potential always because you're essentially saying, we love you because we love your souls and want you to be saved by Jesus Christ. So it's a love that's parenthesized by that caveat and I think for many of them, it is a genuine caring for humanity because they're sincere in their faith, and they want to save you. They don't want you to go to hell, to put it bluntly. But on the other hand, it can have a political side to it, right? And uh, it's very easily can turn that way. So thank you for that, bringing that point up. Thank you. Thank you.